So, it was early in the morning, one of the first churches that we visited. And as usual, Janet, Esther and I were given the places, pride of place, right up at the front. So as we walked up to the front of the church, we sat in our, the plastic sun chairs that were there. And I sat down and noticed on the wall over there, a great big spider. <laughs> okay, okay, that's fine, it's over there, no problem at all. I looked round the church and noticed on the wall just here, another great big spider. Thought, that's okay, that's over there. And then I kept looking round and looked behind me. And just there was another great big spider about this big. I kind of inched forward in my chair and sat on the edge. They began, and they began as they normally do, with a choir of children coming up the front to sing a welcome, welcome, welcome song. Everybody started, and they were singing. They got to the end of the first line, and suddenly I felt on my back. Oh. I jumped up! Oh, Esther jumped up beside me. Janet jumped up. Magnus was sitting over there. He was wondering what was wrong. And sure enough, the spider had jumped off the wall onto my back. And we were down there. The children were all singing, welcome, welcome, welcome. And Jesus said, oh, no. I said, okay, okay. Well, that's okay. It's not on the wall anymore now. It's running around the floor. That's fine. I will take my seat again. Um, however, however, as it um, as as our meeting progressed, the spider crawled back on the wall, and during one of the breaks, we surreptitiously picked up our chairs and moved out into the middle. Of the room. Um, it was just uh, one of the things. I mean, we, we just don't get spiders this big in this country, you know. That was different, but we had a fantastic, fantastic trip. Um, um, to Sierra Leone. So Esther, do you want to come up and hear because we're going to give a report of what it was like. So this is Africa. Sierra Leone is just, oh, it's not working very well, it's just there. I won't hold it. That's Sierra Leone, just there. You can see, surrounded by Guinea and Liberia. And you are possibly wondering, why on, earth, why on earth did we end up in Sierra Leone? <coughs> well, in the 1700s, the 18th, 18th century revival, this lady, Countess of Huntington, as you know, funded a lot of the work of the revival. That was Wesley and, and Whitfield. She, um, she built the chapels. She founded a Bible college. She provided, she was very, very wealthy. She was a peer of the realm. She provided huge exposure in London and things for Wesley and Whitfield. And quite frankly, she paid for an awful lot of it in the ministry of what they were doing. Um, part of her real passion was, as I say, the Bible college, training up ministers and people here in this country, but also to send them out. And Countess of Huntington kind of missionaries from the Bible College and the Huntington Connections set off to America, which of course in the 1700s, the colonies were very new there, and other nations. But particularly in America, where, where Whitfield um, ended up as well, churches were planted there. Churches that didn't just reach the white folk, but reached all the other nations, people groups that were moving over to the American colonies. That included those people, the blacks, who had been taken over there as slaves. When the abolition of slavery came in and they were released, they were able to head off if they, if they chose, if they could, if they had the money, to other places. And in 1792, a group of Africans returned to Africa, having been released, and they headed for Sierra Leone, which was a British colony, um, which the town, Freetown, had been established as a home um, for those after the abolition of slavery. And so the first group went there in 1792. They took with them their church, which was the Countess of Huntington Church. 
because that's what they had grown up with and what they had known. So there in Sierra Leone, unbeknownst to the England Countess of Huntington Church, was a whole group of Countess of Huntington Churches in Sierra Leone. In the, in the early 1900s, we discovered each other. The English side and the Sierra Leone side discovered that we were all Countess of Huntington Connections Churches. And um, it was just after the Second World War that the British churches and the Sierra Leone churches formed a partnership, a partnership that seems still continues. Each group of churches, our denomination here and in Sierra Leone, are autonomous. There's no, we don't have any governance over them. They don't have any governance over us, but we work together. And one of the ways that we work together is that here in Britain, we set up the Sierra Leone Mission. The Sierra Leone Mission provides funding for Sierra Leone and the Countess of Huntington initiatives that are going on there. Um, they're, they're in charge of their schools, they're in charge of their churches, but it is an incredibly, incredibly poor country. And so we help them. We send out money every month to help pay the pastors and the school teachers and to train new ones. We help fund projects like new buildings, roofs and the Bethesda Orphanage. And it has grown into a huge ministry of the Connections Churches here. As you know, we gather the, the shoe bags and send out the boxes and everything like that. So we've been doing that for some years now, since we've joined in. Um, the shoe bags, um, you know that they're all put together. and puts them together and we send them out. And of course, for the past couple of years, it's been books for schools and the sleeping bags that we've salvaged. We also, as a church, give money to Bethesda. So each year we send over a donation to, for the orphanage there. And so this trip, this trip out to Sierra Leone, what was it for? It was for a number of different reasons. Firstly, I wanted to see where our money was going. Okay, I wanted to see it. What is it that we are donating to? You know, we send all those shoe bags, we send all the boxes, we've done the sleeping bags. Where, where is this going, going to? And um, we, we wanted as well, I wanted to do it to, to support the folk out there in their ministry. I'm a trustee of the Connections here. And I felt that it was quite important as a trustee that I could understand the work and what was going on. And so that was another reason that I wanted to go. Um, I also, to, to be honest with you, praying about this actually a couple of years ago, um, many of you will know that I was very much involved with a mission organisation in Belfast and done different trips and things, mostly to, to Eastern Europe, um, but a couple of other places as well. And, um, but that all kind of stopped as a, as a wife and newborn babies and all the rest of it. You can't quite go off gallivanting around. And so it had been several years since I had gone away, um, you know, done a mission trip. And actually a couple of years ago, I felt God saying, Bethany, the, the time's coming, the time's coming, that it will be time again for you to, to um, reach out. And so I was so excited, so excited when the opportunity came for this trip. It was something that we'd prayed about. I was also very, very excited when it came quite clear that it was God's will to take Esther as well and to expose Esther to what really is going to be and was a life-changing, a life-changing trip. And so we organised this trip. I spoke to some of the other people who'd gone out there. I said, can we go over at the end of November when the containers arrive so we can help distribute that? I thought that was a fantastic idea. We'd not done that before, so that was the aim, to head over... Um, um, in at the end of November for the containers. However, you'll be aware that there were problems with the containers. They did arrive in Sierra Leone on the 5th of November and have been held up at the ports ever since and still are. And still are. So that kind of didn't work. And I'm going to come back to this. Um, and, and kind of feedback, because of course it, it was very disappointing, and I'll, I'll explain why it was even more disappointing for Janet in a minute. But this is, the, this is the scripture that really jumped out to me for this trip that I'd like to share with you. And it's from Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7 to 10. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. 
the one who sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life let us not become weary in doing good for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up therefore as we have the opportunity let us to do good to all people especially to those who belong to the family of believers okay and i really really felt that in going out there to sierra Leone, yes i was blessed but i wanted to be a blessing as we went out there and so who was it well this is this is us these are the the team the three of us that went out janet esther and i janet is a wonderful lady she's from st ives church down in in cornwall and um, she's she retired from teaching four years ago having been a teacher for 39 years she helps out and does a huge amount in the church down in um, st ives and she is amazing she is also the lady who has organized the containers this year so she sourced them she raised the money for them god poured in the donations she filled them in fact we sent out two containers two 20 foot containers the idea being that when they go out there, we, we bought them, we purchased them. We not just rented them, we purchased them so they're ours. So they're going to go out and be placed in the orphanage compound um, and be placed there to be used as extra accommodation. So she sourced and found the money to, to, to buy the containers. Um, a 20 foot container was filled within a month of all the donations that she'd gathered in um furniture um books um uh, clothes and things like that the second container 20 foot container was kind of filled by all the rest of the churches and the connections and all the stuff that we sent down there as well but janet had arranged all this she had raised the funds for the shipping she had um, helped with all the organization of this so i mean she has spent practically all of this year focused on these containers and getting out of there. So it was so important to her and she really, really wanted to see those containers when they arrived. Um, she's well known out in Sierra Leone. This was her fifth trip. She's very caring, very compassionate and just pulls out her heart to people. She was devastated that we couldn't see the containers, that they were still tied up in the docks. Um, but we prayed about this and we really sought the Lord and asked him that he would have his way in the trip and what the trip was supposed to be. Esther was also on our team. Oh, I'm a bit biased, but you know what? She's an absolute sweetheart the whole trip. She was just so gorgeous. And everybody, she went, to, she, all the, all the youngsters loved her and loved her smile. And uh, she, it's Esther who's taken most of the photos she took almost a thousand of them um, all together. Um, she, she went and took all, all, most of the photos. So uh, Esther was such, a, such an asset and such a wonderful part of our trip. The other main person I want to share with you is this guy. This is Magnus. And um, I want to say that actually it has been years, and I don't say this lightly, I say this in all sincerity, it has been years since I've met somebody quite like Magnus. He stands out head and shoulders above everybody else. He is such a godly man of integrity and service. I felt really humbled and such a privilege to spend the week with Magnus. Um, he's, um, he's the eldest sibling in the family I met two of his brothers and there was a sister there. There may have been more. I didn't quite get to the bottom of that. I'll explain why in just a moment. But Magnus, at the age of 11, his parents died and he decided he was going to keep the family together. I have no idea how he did that. Um, the poverty in the, in the nation is amazing, but he did. He kept the family together and somehow also managed to go to school and get educated. He is very, very clever. He completed um, a degree in theology. He's then gone on and done a master's in education. He is a very, very clever man. However, his service to God doesn't just stop at his cleverness. He has such a heart for people. It makes you want to cry, to be honest with you. 
He, knowing himself what it was to be left an orphan at the age of 11, he began reaching out to the street children. And it is, it is Magnus with his, one of his brothers, Albert, um, that set up Bethesda Orphanage. Um, he set that up for youngsters, and there's uh, 15 youngsters in the orphanage now. Um, but that's not where he stopped. He's got three children of his own. He's got an adopted son. He's got two fosters, children, and he looks after some nieces and nephews. Uh, hence the fact I wasn't actually sure how many people were in his family or not. Magnus is also a pastor. He is a church planter, and I'll show you a little bit about that again, and uh, does a huge amount of work for the Sierra Leone um, connections out there. He's the superintendent over three churches. He also does a radio program, and he continues the ministry to the street children, and is often asked to preach and teach in the Bible college. Okay. If that isn't enough, because none of those pay anything, he gets a very, very small amount for being the pastor, the superintendent. He has a full-time job with the government in anti-corruption. He's an incredible man. And he is the one, if you want to get something done, he will do it. He is, a, he is such a humble man and a, God, and a man of integrity and completely and utterly trustworthy. Totally. Janet, Esther and I felt completely safe. We took over British money, because you can't get Sierra Leonean dollars or pounds here, so we took over the British money, you know, and there was no qualms. We handed it all over to, to Magnus. He changed it, he sorted it out for us and kept detailed accounts of, of all where the money was going that we took with us. Um, I just want to commend this man to you. Um, this is him all dressed up. There was, he had a very important, it was actually a, a funeral service to go to, the head man of the town of one of the churches and a, and a church warden. So this is him all dressed up in his, his dog collar and his robes that he had to wear um, for, for that. Most of the time he wears a t-shirt and, and, and cargo trousers. Um, but this is Magnus and, and he's the main guy out there um, amongst all the other pastors and the bishop and everything like that. Just to, just to explain about the funds, Sierra Leone Mission, we send money over every month and um, each teacher, pastor, they get about £21, but that's not enough. That is nowhere near enough for them to live on. So all the pastors have other jobs as well. They have other jobs, often teaching or, or something like that, and then they have a small amount and then they go to their church on a Sunday, maybe a midweek meeting, because they're not full-time pastors. There's just one church that actually pays their pastor, and they've only just started doing that this year. The churches are so poor. It's really, really difficult. I'm now going to ask Esther to come up and talk about Bethesda Orphanage. Come on up, darling. Bethesda Orphanage was established in 2013 by Magnus and his brother, Albert, I think. Yeah. Um, to begin with, they found an old property in the town of Waterloo, but with support from England, they built a special compound and a home on the outskirts of the village of Brahma. They currently have 15 children, aged 6 to 17. All the children are orphans or have been abandoned by their parents. A couple came from the villages, but most were found by Magnus on the streets of Waterloo. Life is extremely difficult and dangerous on the streets. Children are used and abused and may be shipped off for child labour. There are only five girls in Bethesda because girls on the streets are immediately picked up and locked away in homes for prostitution. One of the girls at Bethesda had escaped when Magnus had found her. Aminata and Sally are the house mothers. Both are widows and Sally's younger son, Andrew, lives at Bethesda with the other children. They are wonderful and the children loved and cared for. It is a real family and all know the Lord Jesus. Every night they gather together for devotions and we join them. Then we would spend a couple of hours playing games, singing, acting, making paper art and one evening mum taught them how to use an electric sewing machine. <laughs> 
This is the courtyard where they gather during the day. That one. Oh, and this is where Sally supervises homework after they come home from school. In the courtyard. Yeah. Um, this is our room up there, and it was very nice, actually, yeah. The bed was really comfortable, and we even had a fan. It was too hot for sheets, so we just lay under the mosquito net. Our bathroom was luxurious with a flushing toilet. <laughs> Although water is precious, so we operated on the principle. If it's yellow, mellow. If it's brown, flush it down. <laughs> <laughs> we also had a cold, shower, cold water shower, which was wonderful because of the heat. Um, stand underneath, turn on the tap to get wet, switch it off. Soap all over and then quickly rinse. <laughs> the other most important room in the house is the kitchen. All our meals were cooked over these two fires. That one and that one. And this was our food. Breakfast, lunch and dinner. <laughs> yeah. Moving on to the... Um, do you want to... So, what what is it? What did we do? What was it like? A lot of um, a lot of what we did was um, going out to visit. I wasn't sure what our program would be. We were expecting, obviously, the containers to be there, and that's what we planned for. But I'll be honest with you. Other than that. Uh, we, weren't, we weren't sure. And communication isn't easy. Um, Magnus, actually, the way that they communicate is through Facebook Messenger when that works. Um, uh, he hasn't got access to proper emails and things. That's quite difficult to get. Um, and, thing, and phone calls are expensive. So some of it is done through Facebook and, and Messenger in that way. But, so we weren't sure what we were going to do. But Magnus, once we'd arrived, he'd put together a programme. Oh my goodness, was it a full programme? We arrived very late on the Tuesday night. Um, the car broke down on the way to the orphanage, so we were, so we were sitting on the, on, the, on the curbside for an hour or so whilst he sourced another car and got us there. And, um, and so we arrived very late Tuesday night. We slept, we slept really well, but he said, oh yes, no, we're starting in the morning at half past eight. So we were up the next morning, um, having not slept at all the night before, you know, having gone like uh, 40 hours or something without sleep. We were up the next morning um, for our, our fish and rice breakfast and, um, and then heading out. And Magnus took us in his car and we began. We began by going to, um, into some of the rural villages. There's a lot of villages around. And the way that the connections have it set up there is that in the villages, there's a church and there's a school. And those are the two, and they go together and they, they kind of work together. Okay, they're, they're managed separately, but it's all they're working together. And in the villages, as we head out, this is, this is what village life is like. Now, I brought back this, which is a very kind of romantic view of Sierra Leone and African life with the mud huts. And, you know, before going out to America, we have that in our mind, mud huts, and that's what people, uh, what, you know, are, are living. Sorry, sorry, Sierra Leone. What did I say? America. America. Africa. <laughs> we have that in our mind about Africa, mud huts. You know, and then people say, no, 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 that's all so bad because they don't live in mud huts anymore. They, they honestly do. They honestly do. We went out there and saw it. And, and there is one up at the top there uh, with the grass roofs. Um, they don't look quite as clean as this, but... Um, actually, this is very representative of, of village life with the water, the river that's very important, the palm trees, the colour, the eagles flying overhead. Um, and this is, this is what it looked like. And so <clears throat> many, many of the houses are built out of mud bricks. Others are concrete bit bricks. So that might be a, a, a typical home and scene of the village. This one here... Um, a year and a half ago, during some riots over the election, houses were burnt down and set fire to. 
Um, one of the Connections churches, Mortimer West End, sent money to rebuild the homes. That's actually one of the homes that's been rebuilt. That is rebuilt out of cement and with a with a corrugated um, iron roof, which will which, corrugated tin, sorry, roof, which will last much longer. So that's one of the new built houses in the rural area. Uh, you can see basket weaving here. This was just down the road from us. This was our nearest village um, of Brahma that we were staying at, and we walked along and, and found the basket. Um, weavers there and so this is this is rural life this is what life um, is like and um, here we go this is a, a church it's it's a new church it's just been built and they were thrilled because last year when Janet went out it had no roof and the Sierra Leone mission paid for the roof to go on top of that church um, building there. They have no um, chairs in the church um, because they can't afford them. Pews are very, very expensive. Instead, what they will do on a Sunday is that they will take the whatever benches are in the school next door and move them into the church to, to stay there. As you can see, um, at the moment, it's just a dirt floor. These are the kind of benches and, and, and stools and things that might be in a rural classroom. So that's, that's what it's like. That's what the accommodation is like um, out in the villages. Uh, we, but we were given their singing in that one. We were given lots of songs and welcomes every, everywhere that we went. <coughs> city life is, is a little bit different. This is a city church in Waterloo, St Mark's. That's uh, the, the main church in Sierra Leone. Um, all plastered and painted a very pretty pink with pink with a blue ceiling is that right bright blue ceiling i think it was pink walls and then there was yellow was the balcony yellow it was very colorful it was, it was lovely i think we should do that um, it was really really lovely um, this here this is a secondary school town secondary school town classroom so you can see just a little bit bigger a bit lighter um, and they've got other benches i've taken a picture of this because this is a world map on a on a on a, a wall in a classroom, and I'm going to come back to that because the classrooms are there. So this was quite unusual to see a poster up in one of the classrooms there. I'm going to come back to that again. Let me just show you a little bit more flavour of what we were coming to. Um, there in the town, the, 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 you can't really see the photos here, and um, it's very very poor. But up there. This is where the mudslide was a year and a half ago. Do you remember? Um, the mudslide came down and, and flooded the shanty, some of the shanty towns of Sierra Leone. So many people were killed. Um, so many people died and died afterwards of, of fever and things. Um, quite a few of our sleeping bags last year went to those people. This is slum life in the city and the amount of rubbish. It, it was stinking. It was really, really stinky. And so there's, you know, there's rural life, there's town life. Things are, you know, in some ways nicer in the town life, but they're crammed in. And unless you have got lots of money and can afford it, the slum, slum area of the city, there's loads of it. It's, it's very, very distressing. Very distressing. <clears throat> so what happened when we got there? We would go out with Magnus, we would travel to, uh, to a combined church and, and school, and then depending on what happened, they would gather everybody together. So here we are gathered in one of the churches, I think this is the church at Fabena, and um, the school, all the school kids are coming, can you see the green there? That's the Huntington green uniform that all the children wear, and uh, they're crammed in there, and then they are singing welcome to us. Singing our welcome. And um, as, as, as we came in, they would sing, they would welcome us, then the teacher or the pastor or both would stand up, give a welcome speech, introduce us to the other teachers, the other pastors, the people in the church, and kind of tagging things like that. They would thank us so much for coming, thank us for what we're given this year, and then make their requests. And uh, say, we could really do with you know the toilets need to end the, the the pump the water pump was broken we need some more you know we need some more pews um the manse is only half built you know could we we 
not all of our teachers have been trained. Could we please have money to train the teachers and all the rest of it? And then Janet would stand up. She was a representative of the Sierra Leone Mission, so she would stand up and she would bring greetings from England. Sierra Leone Mission and everything like that. Um, and then they would all turn and look at Esther and I. And this is where, I'm going to be honest with you, this is where it was like, ah, oh God, what do we do now? Because <laughs> we had no clue, had no clue. We had no idea that we were going to do this. And so that very first Tuesday night we got in, um, Magnus had said, this is the schedule, this is what we're doing. First thing Wednesday morning, and something like, so what are we doing? What are we doing? We don't have the containers. We don't have all the boxes to hand stuff out. So what is it that we're going to do? And I really, I really wanted and asked God, actually, is this your will that we don't come with all this stuff from the containers? If we had, would we have just been looked at as the rich white people just giving loads of stuff in? I think we probably would have. And I said, God, what is your purpose in this? What is your purpose for us going around these schools and churches? What is your purpose in this? I mean, yes, they love to see us. And this is us providing you know, a connection between the two churches. And I said, God, I want to use me in this. Use me in this to build up the people who are here, to build up the relationship. And you know, I discovered there is nothing, there is nothing worth more than actually meeting people face to face. You know, shaking their hands, which they all do. Janet knew them all, and she just grabbed them all in a great big hug. Um, and, um, you know, there's nothing worth more than that. And I said, God, what is my role in this? And so Janet, she's part of the Sierra Leone mission. She was introduced as that. I was introduced as a pastor from England. So everywhere we went, I picked up the Bible. I said, God, I need help here, I need a verse. And I turned to a verse. And I'd read that verse out and speak about that for a minute or so and then bring greetings and pray a blessing over them. And so, so that's what we did. <coughs> Esther and I, here, here, here's me speaking a message out to, to this. This was a big church, this was a big school. There were actually six schools all on one site and they'd all gathered together. Um, it was well over 800 children. All, all in one place there. And um, in this particular one, I, I felt God speak, tell me to challenge the young people, there was a lot of teenagers there, with the verse, um, he who honours me, I will honour, from Samuel. And I'd speak about that. And then Esther and I taught them the loud pulse, Amen. You all remember that one, don't you? Amen! <laughs> So I tell them, because I need something to engage the youngsters. So Esther will come out and I said, Esther, and I say, this is what we do with our young people. And this. And then I get them to have, to have a go. And of course they do it half-heartedly. And I say, no, 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 you can do it much louder than that. And we got a huge, great big arm in. And then I would um, uh, stretch out my hands and play, pray a blessing over all of them. The children, the staff, the teachers, the pastors, and pray a blessing. Quite wonderfully, they would often put up their hands like this and copy me to, to receive the blessing. And we would end with a, with a, with a great amen. And, um, and this became our pattern. This became our pattern as we went around the churches. And we would travel from, from village to village into the towns, um, managing about six a day. Honestly, we were on our knees by the end of the day um, because we just can't so much. It was just uh, amazing. But it was amazing. It was amazing to, to see the children. It was amazing to, to speak to the pastors. And they were so appreciative of all that we had given. Um, Janet, um, we didn't have the containers there, but Janet had taken over um, an extra suitcase full of things to give out, which included these kind of knitted teddies. Um, I had taken out a pump and some balls so I could give them all a football, pump up a football and send that out, and some little pocket um, 2019 diaries from the pastors. So we just had a few little gifts. So after we'd done the, the, the greetings, the prayer and everything like that, we would have a quiz. And we would ask the children Bible questions, and whoever got it right could come up and choose a prize. And the first thing to go were the books. The books were always the first thing to go. And this is where I need to talk about books. 
Um, because I'll admit that we were quite shocked, Janice and I were quite shocked when we went to the schools at just how empty, empty they are. And for the past few years, lots of books and things have been sent out. And we were saying, well, well where are they? Where are all the stuff that we've been, that's been sent out? Um, because not all of them, but so many of them were empty. And, um, and as we went round and we were asking Magnus, well, where are all the books? Now, what Magnus had also done, uh, and I didn't realise this, and to begin with, I was a bit concerned because the container that went out last year and went out last year and ended up there in November was 40 feet, a 40 foot container with loads and loads of things in. Um, it's not just Anne who'd sent out books and books from here, but books have been sent out from um, some of the other churches as well. Hailsham send out loads of books and some of the others do. And I, I, you know, I was concerned, but, but Magnus, you've distributed them all, except he'd kept back one box of books for each school. And I was kind of like, why, why haven't these been gone out? And, and I realised that part of it was that Magnus, on his own, with all of his other responsibilities, and just in a normal car, is the sole person who'd been distributing 40 feet worth of goods this past year. And you know, he actually couldn't physically take everything just like that because he had to work, he had other things as well. So over the year he's been distributing them out and actually, praise God, he hadn't given out all the boxes of books. He just has a car, the roads are horrendous, he wouldn't be able to take more than one or two at a time in his boots. The car wouldn't survive the weight of the books and the roads there. And he can then, so actually every school we went to, he, he got a, he'd kept back a box of books for every school. So we were actually able to, in every school, give one box of books. And they weren't all the ones that you'd picked up and for the schools, but a lot of them were. Between you and Hailsham, there was a box of books for every school. But we went there and said, what is it? What is it with these books? Why aren't we seeing them in the classrooms? And, and, I, and this was devastating in some ways, but I have to, to be, I want to be honest with you and share with you. The truth is, they have no clue what to do with them. I know that's incomprehensible to us, but they honestly have absolutely no idea. The concept of a library is, is unfathomable to them. There was just one school that had managed that. Just one school that had managed a library. Because they, they don't know. There aren't any public libraries. There aren't any libraries the adults don't know. The teachers teach with a blackboard and that's it. They have no resources. So even though we've taken resources out, actually didn't really know what to do with them because they'd never had those before. The other problem is that um, everything is stolen. So, so, they, so they break into the schools and you know people break into schools and just strip everything and take everything away. So they don't have anything in the schools. I'm just, um, um, let, me, let me come, sorry, this is taking us out of order here. Let me come back to, Ah, oh, no, 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 come back to you. This is what a classroom looks like, but oh, I've, I've messed this up. I've messed this up. Hang on, I'm going all the way back. I'll, I'll show you later when we get to it. Because I know I've messed up my slides. I think the battery's going on this. Um, looks, and so. So there are things that we're hoping to do for the future for that. But the truth is, but they love these books. They are desperate for them. The, the children prize them, the teachers love them. And uh, they were just so thrilled to, to get books. And so this is what we did. And so um, for several days um, through our time there was spent doing this, travelling around from school to church, school to church, praying blessings, doing quiz, talking to the youngsters, meeting the people, hearing their concerns and their needs, giving out books and, um, and doing the quiz with them. So I'm going to ask Esther to come back up now and talk about the Saturday. On the Saturday, we paid for the children to have a holiday. Um, once a year, if they... Once a year, they go to the beach as a special treat. 
We had chicken drumsticks and rice in our lunch pack and then got into a 15-seater minibus, all 34 of us. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that wasn't considered overloaded because we didn't have anyone sitting on the roof. Um, there wasn't a picture, sorry, because I didn't have enough room to move and get my camera out. <laughs> um, we were stopped by the police at the checkpoint, not because of the number of people of the van, that didn't make sense. Not because of the number of people in the band, van, but to check we had permission from the village to use the beach. Um, it was a lovely afternoon. The youngest kid, Mohammed, had never seen the beach and sea before. Um, we all had a great swim, and it was the only time we actually felt the right temperature. <laughs> um, and the sunset was beautiful. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. So that was the holiday for the children. Um, I'm looking at the time. I'm going to have to whiz through these much more quickly. Sunday. Sunday we set off. Sunday was a wonderful day. This is where we set off for the Anne Pink School. It was quite far away. Um, it was very much out in the sticks. It required a ferry across the river to get there. This is the ferry. Okay. Um, when we arrived, a car had broken down. So... Um, it, it, we had to wait for over an hour just to get on the ferry. So we were an hour late before we got there. But it was, it was quite a long journey. Uh, yeah, that's the ferry. Uh, you have to pull yourself across. So there I am, uh, starting to, to, to help with pulling across. We arrived at the Anping School. I know. Oh, it's school. The church is next door to us as well. Uh, and that's called the Anping um, Church. This is inside. Um, this here is um, over, over in the corner here. That's that's Pastor Michael, okay. And uh, Daniel is the head teacher. It was a Sunday, but all the school had turned out um, into the church as well to join to, to meet with us. And uh, we had a great time. We had a really great time. I took over with me um, a photo of us church from the 25th anniversary weekend in a frame to give to them. Oh, he was so excited. He was beside himself with excitement. Was Pastor Michael? So this was me giving a gift of the photo um, to the to the Amping Church there, and um, we had a, we had a great time. And they do have a box of your books already. Okay, it's actually kept in the church because the church is safer than the school. And these are posters, and these are your books stuck in here. And we gave another box of your books over to them, and um, and you know talk to them about it. So, so they are actually using some of the resources and materials that we're sending out. Um, there we go. That's another um, box of books to that. That's the other. The other one was the pastor. This is the head teacher there and uh, he was thrilled and delighted and I told him about all that was coming in this next lot of container. Um, we, that is the Ampink school, that's the school block building, that's the classroom in there and that's the toilets <laughs> uh, for that one there. Um, it was lovely. We then dashed from Ampink school and church to Mabang which is one of um, which is one of Magnus's churches and the church that he has refounded and built and he'd asked me to preach that Sunday. It was great, he was absolutely brilliant. So of course he had the microphone and he was doing the translating. They don't need a microphone for the size of the building that's there, but they use it because the church building is in the middle of the village and it means the entire village hear the church service. So it's one of their ways of outreach. And um, it was a wonderful worship service. It really was. They'd sung and had, we had worship together and notices and had a testimony time. And one of the young ladies was up there giving testimony how delighted she was that her friend had come to church for the first time. And um, I preached, Magnus asked me to do, it was the first Sunday in Advent, to so do something on Christmas. So I did Isaiah 9, um, Jesus, the, the, the uh, light in the darkness. They gave a real gospel message, and it, it, it was so much. Oh, I was having a way of time. I, I forget everybody else. I was just having a great time there, and finished up. So, so that was Sunday at at Mabang, and what a wonderful time we had. Other places that we went to. Well, this is actually the blind school. I don't know if you can see it. She's using a braille thing there and things. So we visited the blind school. It's a boarding school. 
Uh, the children stay there all the time. They're actually very well cared for, and um, and that was a that was a great place. I'd taken a couple more Braille cards to donate for to them, and hoping to support them further. This is a library. This is the Bible College Library. It has lots of books in, and we've sent out more books for the Bible College. Um, what can I say? They are thrilled and so proud, and of course they should be. But I was looking through, and I'm really hoping to be able to source some more um, materials for them because it, it's very, very old, you know, books and very dated. Um, but they have such a passion, and education is so important, and so many people use this. Again, it was a real privilege to go to the Bible College and, and witness. At the Bible College, they've also opened up a clinic. To, to, to help um, mums and babies and young people. So they are really putting so much the gospel and faith into action. It, it was just wonderful. It was wonderful to, to be with them and see them. One of the big things that we wanted to do and part some of you gave money for was to feed the street children. So this is very much Magnus's heart. This is his passion. I think um, if he could, he would like to work full time for Connections and Bethesda and work more with the street children. This is making up food to take out in these portions. Um, we took out 56 with us. Last year they'd taken out 40. This year it was decided 56. We went out, this is us all putting it all together, Laminata and Sally had cooked it and we put them all together. We went out into the streets and the photos aren't good because it's dark and there's no street lights or anything like that. But we but we tried to we tried to take some photos here. Um, Magnus asked as we went into Waterloo that I would share a, a gospel message and he would translate a gospel message there to the youngsters and pray for them. And then we would hand out um, food. When we got there, there was a crowd of 80. And they weren't just little kids, they were older ones as well. And Magnus, uh, he, he was almost in tears. He said, it, it's just getting worse. He said, it gets worse every time I come out. He said, they know me, they know that because he is there, that he's working with the children. He said, but these are young men. And he said, and these are young men who are hungry. He said, in previous years, they wouldn't have come and taken the food of the small children. Their pride as young men wouldn't have allowed them. He said, but they've got no pride left. They're just so hungry. And um, I don't have photos of it here, but you know, hearing from one of the guys in the village who has a plot of land, they haven't had enough rain this year. The crops are not going to be enough again. And so they're still going to continue hungry. Um, so we so, I, so I, we spoke and we prayed for them. We then began handing out meals. Now the youngsters, the kids, the young men, there was no problem with us. They weren't aggressive or angry to us, but they were pushing and shoving each other a lot. And, um, and although we didn't feel unsafe, the crowds were so much and they were shoving each other so much that Magnus said, we're going to have to get you. Let's get you back in the car and away from here. And he left Albert and his, one of his other brothers, Robert, to... Um, and one of the young men um, from the orphanage, um, um, Abdul, to, to then hand out the rest of the food, just because there was so much shoving and pushing, and he didn't want us to get tripped over in the middle of that. Um, but it was heartbreaking afterwards. We did talk about possibly whether next time um, there is a room, um, a hall that we could maybe hire just for the evening and have people on the door and just let people in you know, a few at a time rather than being on the streets handing out. So that's something that might happen next. Um, but it, it was very moving, a moving time. We also found another orphanage. Now this is an orphanage just along the road from us that we visited. Um, that's, the, that's the girls' dormitory. There were four mattresses in there. Um, there, were, there were ten girls sleeping in there. It was a terrible state. It was a really awful state. Um, however, as we looked around and, and thought, oh, this is so awful, and things, we realised actually they wouldn't trade that for going back to the streets. Mm. The streets are far too dangerous. So although it certainly wasn't anywhere near the standard of Bethesda or what we would consider to be you know, um, acceptable, um, they are at least not living on the streets, the girls and the boys, and they're able to 
and the brothers there, and go to school, because the school was just um, opposite them, and all the children were able to go to school. So we, um, yeah, we went uh, into that. Um, coming back to the books, so one of the things that Mangs has done is given every school now one of those um, metal containers to lock the books up. This is the school that has a library. And again, this is something that Magnus is hoping to work with the teachers. And in some of the schools, there is a spare room that can be used and to get that set up. But of course, they have no shelves or anything like that. So, so that's going to have to be um, um, built up with. But one of the things that, that, we are, um, that we're thinking about and that really Janet and I talked and strategized, she's planning to go back in June. I'm not going back in June, but she will be. And she's a teacher. And actually, she's going to do some teacher training. So there is huge scope there for um, you know, support and things to go out there and teach and to train teachers how to teach. And um, what, what Janet is thinking is that the closest school, which is within walking distance of Bethesda, to go in there with paint, paint over the classroom. We can't put posters up. They'll probably be stolen. So instead, put stencil things onto the wall and make that all look really nice. And then she's going to work with them and train some of the teachers. There's another guy going out in January to do some work with the secondary school teachers. And that's possibly the next step for this. So um, this, is, this is some of what we did. Just, a, just some of what we did on our trip out there. Um, a couple of days were spent trying to see if we could get the containers released. This is what the issue is. We are a charity. We are able to send it out duty-free. If we send it out duty-free, they don't get the money that they want from it because it's duty-free. So they have compounded the containers and said, no, you need more certificates, more letters and things that have to be stamped by various different ministries in the Sierra Leone government. We are going through that process. What, of course, would make it easier is if we had paid bribes to get them released, but we won't pay bribes. Um, what we suspect will eventually happen is that they will say, okay, well, the containers have been sitting here for over a month. Now you have to pay us because we've been keeping them for a month, you know, and you've been taking up our space. So that's what we're expecting. Unfortunately, although letters, certificates, and Magnus has been working so hard, and we've had try, he's tried to get in touch with other people who will help. The containers still haven't been released. Now, obviously, everything that is in there will go out to the youngsters, but the shoe bags are the Christmas presents, and those children don't get any other Christmas presents. They don't, and very often the shoe bags are shared between the whole family, which is why Anne sticks in a couple of toothbrushes and a couple of other things in there, and so that's that's they're gutted. You know, with that, because those children won't get anything else and the shoe bags are their Christmas presents. But once it comes through, eventually they all the stuff will get there. The reason why in past we've sent out boxes on pallets, the problem with sending out boxes on pallets is that the boxes are easily snaffled away and some of them always go missing. If we send out containers, it means that we can guarantee that most of the stuff will actually arrive there. But there's this problem with the containers. So it's something that the SLM will be looking at <clears throat> this next year before making a decision of what will happen next September is can this be made any easier? We're not the only charity. We're not the only organisation in that position. There are other charities who were there and crying because their containers were stuck on the docks and couldn't get them out. A lot of other charities simply now, they do not ship to Sierra Leone. They don't give anything because they can't get them through the customs. So ours will get through eventually, we're just not sure when, really. Um, you sent me out with some money, there were some various donations given in and some from the church, some of the money that we, um, I had £300 that had to be, was designated use for midwives and babies, I handed that over to a wonderful lady, the wife of the bishop, who is a midwife, she was so excited. She was just so thrilled. She immediately went out and bought all sorts of things for babies and um, mums in, in her part. She's out in the rural area to care for them and she was just so grateful. We fed the street children <clears throat> and money went there. Some other money that we, we, we paid for the holiday to the beach 
um, and we gave out some other money to some people who were very, very sick and ill. There was at least six, one of them being a little lad who'd broken his leg in two places the week before, and they hadn't had money to take him to hospital. So we paid for him to go to hospital to, um, to have his leg set um, and to recover. And so there was about six um, other people that, that were ill and were sick and needed things, and that's where some of the money went um, for that. I'll be honest as well, I also gave some money um, to Daniel, who out of his own pocket and working is supporting so many other people just because he's a giver. And we gave money for him, um, <clears throat> primary school aged children, tuition is free. After primary school, you have to pay for it. So all of that up. And Magnus is supporting so many kids, so many people with that. And I gave him a gift of money as well. So the money was the money was well spent and well used that you gave me. Thank you so much. And that really went to, to minister to the people there. There are needs, there are always needs. There are churches and schools that need new buildings. This is one school. They've outgrown their property and the church has helped them put this up. This is a temporary building. As soon as it rains, the rain will just flow straight underneath. They would love a new building. There's some that would like um, some more toilets. And Pink School, it's a rural school and way out. What they have asked, um, what they have asked is behind the toilet block, there's this plot of land here. Um, they would like to purchase that and turn it into a school garden. It's, it's swampland, so it's down by the water, so they will be able to grow bananas, pineapples, you know, mangoes and everything like that. And that if the hope would be that that garden would then, so the fruit would come in for the children and then anything left could be sold or used in the village or sold then because, I mean, honestly, the bunch of bananas everywhere, you know, just because it could be sold to bring more money in. So that was the, the Anne Pink request there. I'll just go back to here. This is Fabena. This is a school in the church. But this pastor, Ambrose, who's the pastor here, has such a passion and such a desire to reach out the villages. They're already sending people out to the villages. He's asked for a PA system with a microphone so he can do the street preaching, so he can stand in the middle of the village and everybody hears. And when they do that, churches are planted. People respond to Christ. They commit their lives to Christ and come in. So these are some of the some of the requests. Magnus himself, he's got Bethesda, he's got the orphanage, it's all cared for, nothing else is needed for that. What he would like to do next is set up a clinic um, for you know healthcare clinic there as well, um, not far, and use that as another ministry and way out way out. I would want to say, oh, that's loads and loads of money in there, but actually, because it's Magnus, there is no question, all the money will be used for exactly that. He is a man of integrity and passion and gets things done. So I have no, no hesitation in recommending Magnus and those things. Um, so I'm way over time, sorry everybody, but if we can pray, this is the shoe bags last year, the last school that we visited way out called Mile 91, because it's 91 miles from Freetown, we went to a school and there I saw a little girl on the front row and in her hand was an extremely, absolutely filthy black, you couldn't see what colour it was, shoe bag from last year. That's the bag that she uses for school. Um, so if we, we just need to keep praying and praying that the containers will get there, that the shoe bags will go. And honestly, all the stuff that we are given giving it, it is all being used they are so desperately poor and it is all being used so thank you very very much for all that you've given i have a few things up here that you can come and have a look at if you wish um, i do have a gift for anne so anne your your service and all your contribution has been recognized and this is from magnus to say a huge thank you to you, Anne, and a gift back to you for all that you've done. And um, the other thing is that for the, I got this for the church because our collection plates are disintegrating. 
And so I bought some new ones back from Sierra Leone that were, that were woven there. So we are now, it's very, very late. We're going to finish with our last song and take up our collection in our new collection place. Um, that are very, very colourful, aren't they pretty? And things, and uh, let's, let's do that, shall we? I'm sorry to keep you, yes, I know people have to dash away and do that, but let us finish with our final song. Um,